Thank you and good afternoon. The next item of business this afternoon is a statement by John Swinney uh, updating us on issues relating to the Scottish Child Abuse Inquiry. The Deputy First Minister will take uh, questions at the end of his statement and therefore there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on John Swinney. Presiding officer, I would like to provide Parliament with an update on a number of points within my responsibilities in connection with the Scottish Child Abuse Inquiry and other questions in relation to addressing the consequences of historical abuse. First, I would like to set these decisions in context. In 2004, the then First Minister, Jack McConnell, officially apologised to victims of child abuse in residential care homes. What Mr McConnell said then was a first and very important step on behalf of us all. But survivors made it clear it was, in and of itself, insufficient to address the scale and the nature of the issue. In 2010, the Scottish Government invited the Scottish Human Rights Commission to work with survivors on a framework for justice and remedies for historic abuse of children in, cha in care. Based on this work and at the further request of the Scottish Government, the Scottish Human Rights Commission and the Centre for Excellence for Looked After Children in Scotland, CELSIS, established an interaction group to work with in-care survivors to make recommendations on how they could best be supported. In the two years since the interaction reported in 2014, the Government has taken unprecedented steps to begin to address the wrongs perpetrated by individuals and institutions who should have cared the most for some of our most vulnerable children. Those steps included establishing one of Scotland's most wide-ranging public inquiries into the abuse of children in care, establishing a national in-care survivor support fund, supporting an apology law and legislating to create a national confidential forum for in-care survivors. As Parliament knows, the previous chair of the inquiry and one of our panel members resigned from their posts in the summer, citing accusations of government interference in the inquiry's work. I did not then, and I do not now, accept the complaint made. The government established an independent inquiry, and I am determined that that is what should be delivered. In my discussions with survivors since these events, they have, asked, they have raised with me issues in connection with the replacement of a panel member, the remit of the inquiry and on redress for survivors. I want to update Parliament about all of these issues today. On panel membership, I listened to a range of views from survivors when I met them in July and appointed Lady Smith, an experienced judge in the inner house of the Court of Session, to lead the inquiry. Lady Smith joins Mr Glenn Houston, who continues in membership of the panel. There may be the need in time for further specialist knowledge to add to that of Lady Smith and Mr Houston, and the Inquiries Act 2005 permits Lady Smith to appoint assessors if need be. On that basis, I do not intend to appoint a replacement panel member. I am not required to consult Lady Smith on that issue, but I considered it appropriate to do so, and she is content with my decision. The current remit of the Scottish Child Abuse Inquiry was arrived at following extensive consultation and engagement with survivors and other interested parties. As a result of this, we broadened the definition of in-care settings within the remit to include, for example, foster care, and we also ensured that the inquiry was able to consider not only sexual, sexual abuse, but also physical abuse, emotional abuse and neglect. A timescale for concluding the inquiry was set reflecting the views expressed by some survivors, particularly older survivors, about it being sufficiently focused to produce meaningful recommendations within a reasonable timescale. Since the summer, some survivors have told me they wanted to see the current remit extended to include abuse which took place in non-residential settings such as local parishes, day schools and youth organisations. Other survivors pointed out that if read narrowly, the current remit might not allow the inquiry to pursue evidence of abuse when children were outside the care home, for example, when they attended recreational activities or summer camps. And some other survivor groups told me they were content with the remit of the inquiry and did not wish to see an extension that could prolong the timescale. It is clear that there is not unanimity on this issue across survivors. Some are strongly in favour of no change and others are strongly in favour of extensive change. It has always been the government's intention that the abuse of children and young people in care is to be taken into account wherever it occurred, and I want to put that matter beyond doubt. As the Inquiries Act requires of me, I have consulted Lady Smith and I have amended the terms of reference to clarify this point. That is the only change I intend to make to the remit of the inquiry. 
I have to ensure a remit that is deliverable within a reasonable timescale. I have concluded there is a clear distinction between in-care settings and non-in-care settings. In-care settings are those where institutions and bodies had legal responsibility for the long-term care of children in the place of the parent, with all of the legal and moral obligations that status carries. That is different to the position in non-in-care settings, such as day schools and youth groups, where others had a duty of care on a short-term basis, but crucially were not replacing the role of parents. In too many cases, terrible crimes were committed in those settings too. Criminal behaviour should be referred to the police, and I hope where the evidence exists, this will be energetically pursued through the criminal courts. If we set a remit, which would in practice take many more years to conclude, we are failing to respond to those survivors of in-care abuse who have taken us at our word, in government and in parliament, that we will learn from their experience and by addressing the systematic failures which existed, ensure it can never happen again. Yesterday, Presiding Officer, we introduced the Limitation Childhood Abuse Scotland Bill in Parliament, the first bill of this parliamentary term. The bill will fulfil another recommendation from the Scottish Human Rights Commission's report, and we are grateful to survivors who have long campaigned for this change. The bill removes the three-year limitation period for cases of child abuse and will remove a barrier which has prevented survivors from accessing, accessing justice. This bill goes further than any other jurisdictions, by including sexual, physical and emotional abuse where other similar legislation has been limited to only sexual abuse or has only included emotional abuse which is connected to other forms of abuse. This bill also goes further by allowing cases that have been raised previously but were unsuccessful because of the limitation period to be relitigated, regardless of whether they were determined by the court or settled between the parties without damages being paid, subject to appropriate safeguards where this would be incompatible with the convention rights of the defender. However, the removal of the limitation period will not assist survivors whose right to claim compensation has been extinguished through the law of prescription, which is relevant to abuse that took place before September 1964. This is because the significant legal issues and the human rights legislation made it impossible to establish a sustainable way forward. I regret there is no legislative solution that can be found for pre-1964 survivors. Turn the next presiding officer to redress. I have been giving this complex issue serious consideration. By redress in this context, I mean monetary payment to provide tangible recognition of the harm done as part of a wider package of reparations which this government is already delivering. As part of that pa package or reparations, survivors of in-care abuse already have access to the new £13.5 million in-care survivor support fund. This innovative fund is highly tailored and personalised and focuses on helping individuals achieve their own personal outcomes, whatever those may be. I am confident it is already making a difference to the lives of many survivors. I have examined very carefully the issues around the provision of redress. I am grateful to INCAS and to FBGA for making proposals as to how this might be pursued. I have looked into how some other countries have approached this in relation to past abuse in residential institutions. I'm conscious of the connection with the limitation bill and the position of pre-1964 survivors. There is also the question of how it would be funded and the role of other organizations alongside government. I'm therefore committing to a formal process of consultation and engagement on this specific issue with survivors and other relevant parties to fully explore the issues and gather a wide range of views. Discussions have already begun about that engagement process and its timing. I will be in a position to provide details in the coming weeks and can assure Parliament that I will take this issue forward with the urgency it deserves. I would like to close, Presiding Officer, by thanking survivors for their continued input and engagement. I recognise the importance of building their trust and confidence while be being honest with them about what I am able to deliver. This Government remains committed to addressing the issues identified in the SHRC Action Plan on Justice for Victims of Historic Abuse of Children in Care. We have made real progress in delivering its recommendations. The decisions I have outlined today are another important step towards realising our collective goal of addressing the systemic failings that existed. They are part of our collective determination 
that children in care must be better supported and protected than ever before. Can I thank the Minister for a statement? We will allow about 20 minutes for questions, and if members who wish to ask a question would press their request to speak buttons now, that would be very helpful. Uh, Liz Smith first. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for a prior sight of his statement, and also for the reassurances that he has provided to this Parliament, and indeed to the wider public, regarding his confidence in the chairmanship of Lady Smith, an appointment which I think has been uh, very well received. I wonder if I might ask two very specific questions of the Cabinet Secretary. Firstly, and most importantly from the angle of complete transparency and public confidence in the future of the inquiry, the Cabinet Secretary has given a very clear indication this afternoon and also at the Education and Skills Committee that he is wholly satisfied that there has been no inappropriate intervention in the inquiry by the Scottish Government. May I ask the Cabinet Secretary if he now believes that that statement and its supporting evidence have been accepted by the survivors of the groups who were quite naturally very concerned when the previous chair and one other member of the panel accused the Scottish Government of interference in the inquiry's work. And secondly, in terms of the decision not to replace the third panel member about which the Cabinet Secretary has clearly consulted with Lady Smith, could the Cabinet Secretary advise of the possible circumstances in which Lady Smith and Mr Houston might require the additional specialist knowledge to be provided to the panel as he mentions on page two of his statement. Cabinet Secretary. Um, can I thank Liz Smith for her uh, question and, and, and uh, echo very much the remarks that she has made about Lady Smith, who I, I think has, um, is a, a, an immensely strong chair of the inquiry, who in her own approach and her record, I think personifies the fact that this will be an independent inquiry. Um, in relation to the two specific questions that Liz Smith raised with me, um, uh, Liz Smith will understand that I don't think it's up to me to comment on behalf of survivors about their views about uh, the actions of government. But I do reiterate on the record uh, my confidence that the, the steps that have been taken by the, the, the government in the past have been entirely appropriate within our responsibilities in terms of the Inquiries Act um, in relation to the, the work of the inquiry. But I do reiterate my uh, very clear determination that this should be an independent inquiry and that my appointment of Lady Smith was designed to give public confidence that that would be the case and I believe it should be the case. In relation to her second question on the appointment of any assessors, I think the skills um, and perspective of Lady Smith and uh, Glenn Houston are well understood by Parliament, but there may of course be issues that emerge that require more specialist interrogation. And that will really be an issue for Lady Smith to determine. Um, she has the power uh, within the organisation of the inquiry to appoint assessors if she believes those skills require to be gathered. And of course, um, it will be an issue for Lady Smith to take forward uh, to make sure that the inquiry is able to fully um, uh, address the issues that are contained within the remit. Ian Gray. The presiding officer, and uh, I too thank the Cabinet Secretary for early sight of his statement. The Cabinet Secretary is right to describe this inquiry as a step to right the wrongs perpetrated against some of our most vulnerable children. And he knows well my view that to do that, it must command the confidence and support of most, if not all, survivors. That confidence has been tested by what they see as faltering steps and delay. Uh, so can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what assurances he can give us that the decision to continue with two panellists instead of three will not cause further delay or slow the work uh, of the inquiry? And secondly, as the Cabinet Secretary acknowledged, many survivors have pursued a wider remit for the inquiry because they believe it unjust that most survivors of abuse will not be caught by the scope of the inquiry at all. The Cabinet Secretary has clarified the remit today but will he confirm that he has not extended it, that he has not brought uh, any survivors into its ambit who were not, in his view, already included? Cabinet Secretary. Um, first of all, um, um, Mr Gray asked in relation to uh, the implications of not appointing a third panel member. Um, I'm confident that that factor alone will not extend the timescale of the inquiry because the inquiry is essentially and has been doing on a consistent basis throughout the summer period 
um, uh, undertaking the necessary contacts with members of the public to uh, engage them in that inquiry. And I don't see um, the possibility that uh, not appointing a third member would contribute towards the extension of the timescale of the inquiry. On well, Mr Gray's um, final point, um, I confirm the point that he's made. I have clarified the, in, the, the remit of the inquiry to make it absolutely certain that where abuse took place outside a residential care setting but involved a child that was in care, that abuse that took place in another setting can be taken into account by the inquiry. What I was concerned about in my dialogue with survivors was that a narrow reading of the remit might not have suggested that was the case. So I have clarified that to put it beyond doubt. But I confirm the point that Mr Gray has made that I have uh, addressed the issue of whether the inquiry should be broadened from its original scope, which was to be essentially focused on in-care settings, and I have decided not to do that. Um, I appreciate that will be a decision that will not please everybody. But my judgment has rested on the fact that if I had done so, I would have inevitably lengthened the timescale of the inquiry and that would have been damaging to the interests of survivors who have pressed the government to make early progress on this question. James Dornan to be followed by Ross Thompson. Thank you, Convener. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his statement and can assure him that the Education and Skills Committee continue to have a great deal of interest in this issue and will play its part to support the inquiry. But we will also, of course, seek to provide appropriate scrutiny as and where it can, particularly to ensure that survivors' interests are properly refle reflected. I was pleased to hear that the Cabinet Secretary intends to look more carefully at the issue of redress, and I'd expect the Committee to explore further this key issue. But in the meantime, can he provide me more detail on what he found when he looked into how other countries have approached the issue of redress? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I uh, welcome Mr Dornan's comments and, of course, uh, make it absolutely clear, as I have done um, to the committee, uh, my willingness to address any issues the committee wishes to draw to my attention or to quench, question me about in relation to um, the government's involvement in the inquiry. There will, of course, be areas of the inquiry upon which I cannot give evidence to the committee because I don't have the knowledge because of the independence of the inquiry, uh, but I'm sure the committee will understand that point. In relation to the detail of redress schemes. Redress schemes in other jurisdictions take a number of different forms and some of them um, re clearly require um, evidence and detail to be provided to substantiate the claim that has been made by individual survivors. And, and obviously that information has been gathered by, go by government and looked at carefully and will be looked at as part of the interaction process that we take forward. I should point out to uh, Mr Donnan, however, that today the Survivor Scotland Fund is open and available to provide support to individuals within Scotland. And I would encourage individuals who believe they would be eligible to, for support uh, to pursue that option to make sure they can uh, obtain the support to which they may well be entitled at this time. Ross Thompson to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I also thank the Cabinet Secretary for early sight of his statement. Within his statement, the Cabinet Secretary draws a distinction between what is an in-care setting and a non-in-care setting, providing that defined legal position. Non-in-care examples um, of day schools and youth groups are given. In seeking absolute clarity, can the Cabinet Secretary provide any further examples of what would be considered non-in-care settings? Cabinet Secretary. In a sense, I think what I would be probably safer to do is to refer Mr Thompson to the original remit of the inquiry which provides um, a, a, on the second page of the terms of reference a series of definitions that provide I think very sharp clarity about what is included within the scope of the inquiry um, and, I, and, and I hope that's of assistance to him. When I looked at the issues raised with me by survivors, particularly about the issue to which I referred to in my answer to Mr Gray. I was concerned that there was the potential for there to be some dubiety about abuse that may have taken place out with the, per, the boundaries of a residential care setting. And uh, the government was very clear that we did not envisage that to be 
essentially an artificial boundary for the inquiry. So I've taken the opportunity today to address that issue, to put it beyond doubt, and I hope that's of help and clarity to individuals. But I think Mr Thompson will find the definitions that are attached to the terms of reference um, address the issue to which she has raised with me. Jackie Bailey to be followed by Claire Hockey. I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will acknowledge that the InCare Survivor Support Fund is completely different to compensation for the injustice that survivors have experienced. He will equally be aware that given the length of the inquiry and that survivors having to wait years for justice through the courts, that we could be talking a long time indeed. Survivors are getting older, some are dying. Let me ask the Cabinet Secretary, will he consider making interim payments as they did in Ireland so that survivors are not made to wait any longer? Cabinet Secretary. It, the first thing I would say is that uh, I completely accept the distinction that Jackie Bailey makes between the Survivor Scotland Fund and a redress scheme. Um, my intention in pointing out the Survivor Scotland scheme in my response to Mr Dornan was to make it clear that there is support available at this time that can assist people in addressing some of the difficulties they may face as a consequence of the implications of their experience of abuse. Um, however, a redress scheme addresses a different question and I'm happy to confirm that point. One of the uh, ways that we could have taken forward the question of redress would have been to essentially leave this until the, uh, for the inquiry to determine. And of course, I've not done that. I've established a, uh, a separate process that will enable us to consider these issues and to try to uh, make progress on these questions. Um, and I understand entirely the context that Jackie B raises about the, um, the experiences and the length of time this is taking for uh, survivors to have this issue addressed. Uh, but there are many, many complexities as I explore this issue, which are not easy to resolve. And uh, that is why I think we need to have a process of this type. And I advised uh, survivors of the, the likelihood that that was the approach that I would take when I saw them last week. And uh, I do commit in Parliament today to engaging in that exercise to make sure we advance the issues that I know Jackie Bailey has raised on a number of occasions to make sure we make progress on that question. Claire Hockey to be followed by John Finney. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm aware this is, the Scottish Government has consulted widely with survivors and survivor groups, and I welcome the steps taken so far. Could the Cabinet Secretary confirm that he will continue to listen throughout this process so that we ensure we have the right arrangements and supports in place that we take full account of the impact of abuse on survivors? Cabinet Secretary. There has been extensive consultation work undertaken to design the Survivor Scotland Fund as just one example, but actually throughout the whole of the um, steps that have been taken, the interaction process over a number of years, I think there has been very wide and substantive dialogue with survivors about this point and I'm very happy to confirm to Claire Hockey that the government will continue to approach these questions on that basis. There are of course the obvious conclusions that sometimes we cannot do everything that survivors would like us to do. And I've been very clear with Parliament about the things that I'm unable to do today to address issues raised with survivors. And that's not because the government hasn't listened. It's quite simply because we have to make a judgment about what we consider to be the right steps to take and the steps that will deliver outcomes as, uh, as swiftly and as effectively as we possibly can to address the wrongs that have been committed to individuals and to provide them with some means of coming to terms with the terrible experiences that they have had. John Finney to be followed by Tavish Scott. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for early sight of, of his statement, commend much of the, the, the work that's happened so far, including yesterday the year uh, announcement, Cabinet Secretary, of the introduction of the Limitation Bill. Can I ask in relation to that and the, the comment about real litigation, if any assessment has been made of the numbers likely to come forward there. And as others have said, perhaps um, the engagement isn't completely with all the survivors, and there may indeed be others who will um, be emboldened by this legislation and come forward still. Has there any been any assessment at all, please? Cabinet Secretary. In the uh, financial memorandum that is associated with the, with the limitation bill, um, we estimate that the range um, could be between 400 and 4,000 survivors coming forward with a midpoint of 
2,200 being most likely in terms of the, the, um, the, um, the, the, the cases that may emerge. I, I would be the first to say to Mr Finney, and this rather prejudges the scrutiny by the Finance Committee of the Financial Memorandum, which I know from my long experience is pretty, is very thorough. Um, uh, we will really only know the answer to that question when we see it. And um, the, the, but the best, these are the best estimates of government. And uh, we will, of course, engage with Parliament in the scrutiny of these provisions to make sure that such steps can be taken as effectively as possible. Tavish Scott to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, can I again thank the Cabinet Secretary for his statement uh, in advance. In the terms of reference that he uh, mentioned this afternoon, the second one is to consider the extent to which institutions and bodies with legal responsibility for the care of children failed in their duty to protect children. Uh, would you have regard to the evidence that presumably does sit within government that would have come over the years and under different administrations from elected members, from other organisations, from, from other bodies who will all have given a view to the government of the day about things that they know that were going wrong at a particular time. Would you be prepared to look at that and consider whether it's appropriate to lay that evidence in front of the inquiry as well? Cabinet Secretary. I, I think I, I, I have to set out the terms of reference in a clear fashion, and I, I, I've taken steps today to, to just take that to a point where it cannot be doubted uh, at all in relation to the extension I've made to the very paragraph that Mr. Scott raises with me. Um, obviously, the inquiry um, will take the evidence that it takes. It will be for the inquiry to determine the relevant evidence that emerges. But what I can put on the record, uh, which I will not be in any way a surprise to Mr. Scott, that the government will cooperate fully in any request for information that the inquiry makes of us. Um, and I know the Lord Advocate has made it clear that, that um, in giving that commitment from the Crown as well in relation to cooperating with the inquiry. And that is the approach that we will take to make sure the inquiry has access to all of the evidence that it wishes to have. Fulton McGregor to be followed by Claire Baker. Thank you, President Officer. I was glad to see the Scottish Government show how important this issue is by making the bill the first to be introduced to the Parliament in this session. And I look forward to scrutinising it through the Justice Committee to make sure that we get this right. In the gallery today, we have Sandra Brown, OBE founder of the Moira Anderson Foundation. Just today, Sandra described the trauma of Moira's disappearance 60 years ago as a stain on the Cope Bridge community. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide any reassurances to survivors that the bill will at least begin to address some of the horror and trauma that they have been through? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, first of all, let me pay tribute to the work of, Moira, uh, of, of uh, Sandra Brown of the Moira Anderson Foundation, who's made a very strong, distinguished contribution to this entire area of policy. And secondly, can I say to Mr McGregor that the limitation bill, the, the significance of the, the limitation bill should not in any way be underestimated. This is an enormous departure from legal tradition within Scotland. And it has been undertaken to make sure that we can have the greatest level of scrutiny and interrogation of this part of our country's past. Now, for the reasons that I set out in, in my statement and which ministers have gone through before, um, we cannot go back with the Limitations Bill further than September 1964. But I do hope the extensive change to uh, these provisions to enable this to be the case is recognised as an indication of the determination of government, and I'm pretty sure of all of Parliament, uh, to make sure that we do all that we can to address the wrongs that were committed to individuals in our society. Claire Baker to be followed by Jenny Gilruth. Uh, thank you. I'd also like to welcome the publication of the Limitation Bill. Uh, we all recognise the need to enable survivors to have access to justice as soon as possible. And this is a very short bill. And the government have previously introduced legislation and treated it as an emergency. And given the age of some of these survivors, for them, this is an emergency. Um, can the Cabinet Secretary give an assurance that the bill will be treated with the highest priority and will be treated with a level of urgency in terms of how the Parliament deals with it? Cabinet Secretary. I, I certainly can assure Claire Baker that the government will, will, will cooperate entirely with the parliamentary timetable in terms of advancing this bill. Um, there has obviously been a lot of preparatory work undertaken. A draft bill was published earlier in the year. 
the, um, the, 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 the fruits of that consultation and dialogue have informed the bill. So hopefully we can, as a consequence of that, uh, and as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm intruding on territory that's not mine to determine, where committees can take that perhaps into account in the timetables that are set. Um, but the government will certainly do everything we can to ensure that the timescale is as swift as possible to ensure that this legislation, which I know will be widely supported within Parliament, is able to reach the statute book as quickly as possible. Jenny Gilruth to be followed by Gil Patterson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the clarification on the terms of reference and I think it's important that we continue to make it as clear as we can that the abuse of children in care will be taken into account regardless of where that abuse occurred. I appreciate the difficult balancing act the Cabinet Secretary has in finding unanimity on the terms of reference and the timescale, but could he outline how he will support and continue to engage with those who were in favour of extensive change? President Officer, there is obviously um, a willingness on the part of the government to continue our dialogue with uh, survivors. Um, we, we have to ensure that the, we are open to that information. Obviously, there are specific questions on which we take that, uh, that discussion forward. I think it's equally important that the inquiry is able to proceed to address its terms of reference uh, as expeditiously as possible. And um, I know that is the focus that the inquiry has. And I hope the clarity that I have given today enables the inquiry to do exactly that. And our final question from Gil Patterson. Uh, many thanks, Presiding Officer. Uh, given that the Scottish Human Rights Commission established interaction and said previously that, and I quote, the justice system has not and is not working for survivors, is the Cabinet Secretary confident that the bill introduced to Parliament will fix that? And can he outline what discussions he has had with the Scottish Human Rights Commission? Cabinet Secretary. I think the, 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 the limitation bill essentially is, is an enormous step, as I explained to Mr McGregor in my answer just a moment ago, an enormous step uh, by the government to open up legal redress for individuals who have been the victims of childhood sexual abuse. And the fact that that, uh, I, I think the, the, the bill is a very direct response to the quote that Mr Patterson shared with Parliament uh, from the Scottish Human Rights Commission. Um, we obviously have benefited enormously from the, uh, the, the process that's been led by the Scottish Human Rights Commission and by Celsus, and uh, we will continue that dialogue to make sure that we learn all that uh, we need to learn about how we can uh, address these issues properly and effectively on behalf of the survivors of abuse. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary and all members for their contributions. We'll now move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on innovation. We'll just take a few minutes or seconds to change seats.